Hey, this is Pastor Josh. Just want to thank you so much for watching our videos. If you'd like more information about Legacy City Church, you can go to LegacyCityChurch.com. And if you really enjoy these videos, please don't forget to subscribe below. God bless you. We're in 1 Corinthians chapter 10 in our Bibles, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, and we have been working through the book of, or the letter of 1 Corinthians, chapter by chapter, verse by verse, we look at it each and every week, and we are extracting from all the things that Paul had said to a church in Corinth. Now, Paul is actually writing to a church in the city of Corinth. If you want to go to Corinth now, you can still get on a plane right now, LAX, and you can fly over to Greece, and you can visit Corinth even now. And some of the remains are still there, but Paul was actually writing a real letter with his hand to this church because there was some problems going on. There was some medicine that needed to be given. There was some issues. You see, the church was allowing the world to influence them more than they were influencing the world. And we are to be a light. We are to integrate into the world around us, but we are not to be influenced by it. We are the influencers. We are the light that shines in the darkness. This church was being affected greatly by the world around them. And so Paul had to write a corrective letter to minister to him. The title of this series as we work through this book is called Timeless Sins. Because as they were struggling with these sins 2,000 years ago, guess what? Humans don't change. They're doing the same stuff over and over again. And we see that the timeless sins of back then are still happening here today. And we will see some of them here in our text now. The title of the message today is titled The Double Life. The Double Life. The Double Life. Because Christianity has infiltrated America, because we love to say things and seeing things like God bless America. We have a culture of people who, yes, many of them worship God on Sunday, but then worship other things during the week. They come in with shouts of joy and praise and honor to the Almighty, and then they walk out Monday and act like they haven't even spent time with Him. Many times we do not allow our Christianity or our walk with God to impact our day-to-day life. That's why revival doesn't happen. You ever see churches, you hear movements, everybody's shouting revival. Everybody wants the hype of revival, but no one wants the repentance of revival. The repentance that comes with it. Acts 3.19, Peter says, repent therefore, watch this, repent therefore, watch this, repent therefore that times of refreshing may come in the presence of God. No refreshing, no revival, no presence of God unless there's first repentance. That's a scary word. It sounds scary. What does that mean? All it means is turning away from worshiping other things during the week and worshiping God during the week, worshiping God with our whole lives. What does worship look like? You say, I love you, Jesus. Jesus says, if you love me, obey my commands. Walk with me. Walk with me through life. Live for me. That's why revival isn't happening. Remember what Jesus told the Pharisees, the religious? They were, they were worshiping to some degree. They were in the synagogues. They were the religious guys doing all these outward motions, lifting their hands, bobbing towards uh, the glory of God, doing all kinds of things like reading the scriptures even, keeping the rituals. And Jesus said, you praise him with your mouth, but your heart is far from him. That means that all the outward was there. They look very religious, very holy, very godly, trying to. But on the inside, they were dead. And that is the state of the church today. How can we have so many people in America claim to be Christian, yet we don't see revival? How can only 12 men turn the whole world upside down, and we got millions of people saying that they know Christ, and we can't turn this nation upside down? Paul was dealing with this in Corinth. They were worshiping two masters. They were serving two different gods. They were worshiping on Sunday, but they were running from God Monday to Saturday. We're in 1 Corinthians chapter 10. We're going to read verses 1 through 5 together. Would you stand for the reading of God's word? We stand for the reading of God's word to pay honor to him, so you always remember 
This isn't my words. My words isn't going to do very much for you. Um, they may encourage you to pump you up a little bit, but at the end of the day, it's not going to change your heart. It's not going to change your mind. You know what will? God's word. And so we need to look at it and we need to focus on it. The Lord is speaking to us through his word. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, starting in verse 1 there in your Bibles, it says, the apostle Paul writes, for I do not want you to be unaware, brothers, that our fathers were all under the cloud and all passed through the sea and all were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea and all ate the same spiritual food and drank the same spiritual drink for they drank from the spiritual rock that followed them and the rock was Christ. Nevertheless, most of them, God was not pleased for they were overthrown in the wilderness. Let's pray. Father, we come seeking you again. We recognize this is your word and we now ask that you would speak to us clearly in our own language, in our own culture, in our own situation, in our own lives. We ask for you to minister to us, Holy Spirit. Teach us your word, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You can be seated. Paul says, I don't want you to be unaware, brothers, sisters, church, that our fathers were all under the cloud that passed through the sea. He's talking about the Old Testament. He's talking about the Israelites in the desert. Do you remember that story? Remember Moses goes to Pharaoh, let my people go. You know, you saw the Disney movie, right? Let my people go. And he, uh, he, you know, he does let them go after many plagues and they run into the desert and they're backed up against the Red Sea and the people are freaking out and they're all mad. Moses, you brought us out here to die. He's like, stand back, you idiots. Let me take care of this. And he raises his staff as God had told him. He parts the Red Sea and they walk on dry ground. And there are the Egyptians barreling down to come and kill God's people. And they get out on the other side of the Red Sea. The Egyptians come in. The waters close in and destroy all the Egyptians. The Israelites are free from Egypt, free from the world, walking with God through the wilderness. And they wandered there 40 years because they were stubborn and would not turn ultimately to God. That doesn't sound like the right story. It sounds like something's wrong in that story. It should, have, they, it should have been, and they went through the Red Sea, and they walked with God into the promised land happily ever after the end. But sadly, they did not. What could have taken them a year or less, they could have made it into the promised land quickly. They wandered for 40 years with no direction. Paul pulls up an illustration. He, loving the church, gives them a warning saying, I don't want you guys to be unaware of this because it could very easily happen to you. And to some of them, it was already happening. What was happening? They were using their freedom in Christ, their forgiveness from God, and freedom from the law to run back into sin and worship other gods, idolatry, it is what Israel and their forefathers did thousands of years ago prior. They were freed from the gods of Egypt. They were freed from the oppression of Pharaoh. They were freed from slavery. Egypt was a picture of sin, being chained to sin, not having the Holy Spirit, not being forgiven, not being set free. They were chained to it. But God loosed them from their slavery and gave them freedom and they crossed through the Red Sea and they were free now to worship and walk with God. But what did they do? They ran back to their old gods. They ran back. Does that sound familiar? Kind of sounds like the church a little bit, huh? We're free in Jesus. Let's worship the Lord. He's forgiven me of my sin. Now I'm going to run back to the old gods, my old ways. I'm just going to get right back into sinning like I did before, as if Christ hasn't changed or transformed me at all. I'm going to subdue and suppress the light within me and not make an impact in this nation, not make an impact in this city. He said, remember our forefathers freed from Egypt? God led his people through the wilderness with a cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night amazing miracle right before their eyes every single day. Yeah, the Israelites, three million of them in the wilderness, Moses, they're leading them. They would wake up and boom, there was a cloud over them during the day. 
And when the cloud started moving, they followed that cloud. That was God leading his people through the wilderness. Guess what? Magically at night when the cloud disappeared, a pillar of fire showed up and just stood there before them. You show me God and I'll believe and I'll worship him. Really? They had him right in front of them, a pillar of fire sitting in front of them that moved through the night and they followed that pillar of fire through the wilderness. Moses was their physical leader, but God was leading them ultimately. And he led them in circles because they were rebellious. You ever feel like you're wandering in circles? Ever feel like it's just not getting there? Let me ask you, would God allow discipline in your life to stop you from moving forward because you can't get this thing right? Listen, if God has already told us something and already spoken something into our lives and we're not going to be obedient in that, why would he allow us to move forward anymore? Then we're going to stop there. We're just going to take some time and wait until you're ready to move into the promised land. Sadly, they never made it. But do you know, as verse 4 says, that the Lord gave them food from heaven, every day, special delivery, better than Amazon Prime. I mean, it was on time every single morning. You ever get one of those deliveries at Amazon Prime? We'll be here by 8 p.m. It's like, thanks. I guess that's that's terrible, huh? That shows how impatient I am. (laughs) All right. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. Thank you. 8 p.m., and then it doesn't show up or shows up at 9.30, and you're like, come on, you know, and then they're like, oh, sorry, it didn't show up. But it's better than Amazon Prime. It was manna. Manna, you ever heard that word? It was this, it was this kind of like breadcrumbs that fell from the sky, and the word manna in the Hebrew, you know what it is? The word means, what is it? Because they didn't know what it was. It was this bread from heaven, and they could make little cakes with it, but you couldn't store it up for more than one day. If you stored it up, it would mold and rot, and bugs would get into it. So God gave them enough only for one day, one at a time. Don't store it up. One, trust me, each day I will provide for you. Each day it will show up on your doorstep. Every single morning, the manna came down. You know what they did? They started complaining. Oh, we, we get bread every day. We don't like bread. We want meat. When are we going to get the meat delivery, God? It seriously happened. So you know what he did? He sent them meat. Quail, birds came down from heaven like you wouldn't believe and started showing up more than they could handle. And they had all the meat that they wanted. You know what they did after that? They complained some more. Sounds familiar, huh? God took care of his people in practical ways, supernaturally. Practical ways, supernaturally. And he still does it today. Do you believe that? Do you believe that God takes care of you in practical ways, supernaturally? The bread shows up. You complain, the meat shows up. Do you know they walked around in the dirt for 40 years and their sandals, their sandals were better than Adidas and MDs, right? They did not wear out. These sandals stayed with them for 40 years. God supernaturally allowed them never to wear out. They didn't need another pair of shoes, so they walked through the desert for all of that time. Absolutely amazing miracles. My favorite part, verse 4 says, and all ate or all drank the same spiritual drink. They drank from the spiritual rock that followed them, and the rock was Christ. It was Jesus. They drank from a spiritual rock that followed them, it says. A spiritual rock that followed them. And that rock was Jesus, following them in the wilderness. Jesus was there in the story of Moses. Jesus was there with them. And they couldn't see him, but he was there. Can I go back to the text for you? If you want to turn there, you can. It's Exodus 17. If not, you can just listen. Exodus chapter 17, listen to what happened. All the congregation of the people of Israel moved on from the wilderness of sin by stages according to the commandment of the Lord and camped at uh, Rephidim. 
but there was no water for the people to drink. They're thirsty. We're starving. We need water. Verse 2 says, therefore, the people quarreled with Moses and said, give us water to drink. And Moses said to them, why do you quarrel with me? Why do you test the Lord? You know what he's saying? Has the Lord not given you bread every morning? Did you forget all the stuff he keeps doing? The Red Sea thing, the whole thing in Egypt. What are you guys doing forgetting that? Why do you test the Lord? Verse 3, but the people thirst there for water. And the people grumbled against Moses and said, why did you bring us out to Egypt to kill us and our children and our livestock with thirst? So Moses cried to the Lord, what shall I do with this people? That's a, that's a, pastor's got to underline that. Church leaders underline that. What shall I do with this people? That's a perfect prayer. They are almost ready to stone me. That's funny. I mean, it's not, but it is. Verse five, and the Lord said to Moses, pass on before the people, taking with you some of the elders in Israel and take in your hand the staff in which I struck the Nile and go, in which you struck the Nile and go. Behold, I will stand before you there on the rock at Horeb and you shall strike the rock and water will come out of it and the people will drink. And Moses did so in the sight of the elders of Israel and he called the name of the place uh, Massa because of the quarreling of the people of Israel and because they, they tested the Lord by saying, is the Lord among us or not? They tested him, they questioned him, they were tempted to turn away from him because of water, they were thirsty. This is a trip because they question whether or not the Lord was really among them. And as we read through it, we're like, what are you talking about? Can't you see that God is there? Can't you see that God is moving? Can't you see that God is right there involved? You got manna every single day. You got a cloud in front of your face every day. You got a pillar of fire. What more do you need? You saw the Red Sea. If I saw the Red Sea, I would believe, they say. No, no, you wouldn't. They questioned whether or not the Lord was among them. And Paul says, yes, Jesus was actually following with them, with Moses in the wilderness, providing for them. Does that sound familiar? Questioning the Lord in your situation, wondering if Jesus is near, though your needs are provided for, hum. We look back and we see the Lord took care of us. We see the Lord provided for us. We see the Lord pulled through. We see the Lord did this. We see the Lord did that. We've journaled it down. We've prayed about it. We asked and then we forget. And then we question in the midst of the situation on this Sunday, Lord, are you going to show up? Are you going to come through? Are you really there? They couldn't see him, but he was there. Legacy, family, the Lord is near. He is here. He is with you. He's not leaving you. He is your rock in the wilderness. He will bring forth the water. He will provide the food. He will protect you in the midst of the fire. He will be there, and he's not going anywhere. So don't question him. Verse 5, nevertheless, with most of them, God was not pleased, for they were overthrown in the wilderness. They didn't trust the Lord, though he protected them, provided for them. God was not pleased. Watch this legacy. God was not pleased and disqualified all of them from entering into the promised land over the age of 19, except for Joshua and Caleb. Anyone under the age of 19 was able to go into the promised land. That generation was able to go in. Everybody over, including Moses and Aaron, said, I'm sorry, you're not going into the promised land. What? A lot of people think they can sin and run from God and do whatever they want, and they're just going to still get to enter the promised land. Not so. God actually disciplines his people, even Moses. Are you greater than Moses? You think we're just going to get away with sin and just complaining and doing whatever we want, sinning against him and his faith? Thanks for the forgiveness. Thanks so much. Just going to keep on my way. He says, okay, you're going to wander for 40 years, and then I'm taking the promised land away. Look, you can sin and hurt yourself and hurt the people around you, but you will pay with repercussion. It will come upon your life. And if you don't think that's true, test the Lord, I dare you. Test it and say, you know, I'm going to sin a little bit. 
really sad, another uh, pastor came up in the news again today, and this guy who was hiding sexual sin for who knows how long, all of a sudden, he kept hiding, kept hiding, kept running from the Lord, running a huge mega church, absolutely influential, just amazing ministry stuff that look was coming from the ministry, and hiding, hiding, hiding before, hiding, 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 and guess what? The Lord says, okay, you... Like, you want to abuse the situation? You want to take advantage of my grace and forgiveness? I will expose everything, and I will take everything from you. And he did. The Lord took the church from him, his family from him, his wealth from him, everything. And now he is sitting over in a club in Florida working, trying to run that place. Can you imagine having everything stripped from you when you've claimed that you've known the Lord? I think that's the state of the church today. We say... We love you, God, on Sunday. Then we worship other gods during the week, and we think nothing is going to happen. You think the state of America is in the place it's in today because it's doing things right? It is, we are here because we choose not to worship the Lord. And the day we choose as a church, as a city, to start really worshiping God, legacy, that's the day LA's changed. We have enough people in here. We can do the work, but there's something wrong in our hearts. Disobedience costs them the promised land. Though Moses was forgiven and going to heaven, God said, no, you hit the rock two times and I told you once and you were a misrepresentation of me to the people. You were angry and that's not me, that's not my heart. I will take the promised land away from you. Sad day. Paul lays a foundation for the people in Corinth to see, to learn from the mistakes of Israel. The Lord was right, and he was with them, taking care of them the whole time, but they were moving away from him. Family, one of the saddest things is that we allow the Lord, we love the blessings, we love the grace, we love all that. Lord, take care of me. Lord, provide for me. Lord, do that. Lord, thank you, thank you, thank you. And then we live like he has done nothing. All the grace and blessings should move us to more obedience, a deeper commitment to him. And when that happens, we are fulfilled on both ends. Did you know you get the double blessing? You get the blessings of the grace and the blessings of heaven and the blessings of salvation in your life, and then you get the blessings of obedience and walking with him, the freedom of not having to look over your shoulder and be paranoid all the time. You walk in obedience and you walk in rest. You walk in peace. You heap destruction upon your own head with disobedience in your life. Verse 6 says, Now these things took place as examples for us that we might not desire evil as they did. Desiring evil. Examples for us. But that we might not desire evil as they did. Here is the warning. Get away from evil. Get away from desiring it the same way they did. How did they do it? Disobedience to God is where it began. And they died in the wilderness. Numbers 32, 23. But if you fail to do this, you will be sinning against the Lord. But you may be sure that your sin will find you out. It will find us. The Lord says, in Galatians it tells us, God is not mocked. Whatever a man sows, that he will reap. You, you sow bad seeds into your life, you're going to reap weeds everywhere. You're like, where'd all these weeds come from? What do you mean? You've been throwing weed seed everywhere. You're like, yeah, but look at this. It's choking everything out of my life. Yeah, obviously. You remember Bermuda grass? Is that what it's called? I always get it wrong. Bermuda? Is it really Bermuda? Bahama, come on, pretty much. Bermuda gl- grass? My grandma, she told us about it because she make us pull the weeds in the backyard and she always, get that Bermuda grass or get that Bermuda grass or whatever it's called. And, and she'd always tell us, get it by the root. Because this stuff, it has these weird seeds that if you pull the top, basically just drops the seed in the ground and then just starts sprouting some more later when you're not looking. And it takes over everything. It destroys everything. And the same is true with the seeds of our lives. You can be sure that it will find you. Do I do this to scare you? A little. Because I love you. 
and I don't want it to choke you out. I don't want it to destroy your life. There are plenty of people in here who have already destroyed life and God has resurrected it in beautiful ways. Go talk to them, they'll tell you. Get away from that. Paul lifts the evil desires that they are living out. Are you ready? Verse seven, do not be idolaters as some of them were. As it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. The first sin they were living out was idolatry. They were worshiping other gods. Do you remember what happened in Exodus 20, 32? Moses goes up to the mountain to talk with God, and they're like, where's that Moses guy been? You know, he's been gone for a little while here. He's like, hey, Aaron, can we like pull out one of those little golden calves like we had in, you know, Egypt? What do you say? He's like, yeah, you know, bring your, bring your uh, jewelry together. We'll, we'll, we'll throw it in the fire and out will pop a calf, you know, and so let's make this thing happen. It literally says that in the text when he's talking with Moses. He said, I don't know what happened. I took the jewelry, I threw it in the fire, out came a calf. No, 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 you, you fashioned that thing. You had the goldsmiths like put it together and they were fired up about it. You wanna know why? Because those sins were already dwelling in their heart. They were thinking, man, if we build a golden calf, you know what we'll be able to do? We'll be able to do the big orgy thing we've been wanting to do, that big party we were wanting to throw for a while. So if we get the opportunity, we're going to jump on that. We're going to make that happen. They had that desire in their heart, and they were tempted. And because those secret sins and those secret desires were festering in their hearts, and they were giving to them, they were watering them, they were, they, they were allowing that fantasizing to go on. When the calf came out, they said, yeah, let's party, and the orgy broke out there, sexual sin at the highest level, and guess what happened? When Moses came down the mountain, he was so ticked, they executed 3,000 people right there on the spot. That's what the text says, they killed them all. And God was even more angry, you know what he did? Read down to the end of the chapter, he sent a plague upon the rest of the people and 20,000 more died in an instant. What? Where is this God of love? He's right there. He has told them, he had warned them, he had prepared them, he had sustained them, he had provided for them, he had protected them, and they look God in the face and they spit in his face and say, we don't care what you do. We got a little window to sin, let's get after it. God says, I will not let this infection, this disease to penetrate the rest of the congregation, the three million people, they will be wiped out. The discipline will happen. And it happened there in the text. What is the point of that? Paul says it's been written as an example to us. The example is this. It shows us how much God hates sin and hates when people run from him because it hurts them badly to leave them in their sins and to teach their kids that it's okay to party and to run from God like that and destroy the entire next generation is not acceptable and God was not going to have it. He dealt with it swiftly and quickly, and though we don't see God executing people on the earth like that today, those things were written as an example to us now. He was their president. He was their king. He was their God over the nation. And so his law came down. Luke 4, 8, Jesus backed this up. Did you know that? Jesus said in Luke 4, it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God and him only shall you serve. Not the calf, not sexual immorality. That's verse eight. We must not indulge in sexual immorality as some of them did. 23,000 fell in a single day. That's what I just talked about. Sin number two is sexual immorality. We must learn from this example. Sexual sin, sex outside of marriage of any kind is sin before the Lord and he will allow discipline to come upon the double life. It's not to be welcome in our lives. Why? Because it hurts us. Sex outside of a committed relationship is giving a part of ourselves away to a person that we have not made a covenant with. Sex is abused and used many times in this culture for leverage in a relationship. But within a marriage, did you know, Lust in your heart is adultery. This is sexual immorality. There is sexual immorality before marriage and even after marriage, allowing lust to go on in our minds. That's what they were doing in the congregation. 1 Corinthians 6, 8, flee from sexual immorality. 
Every other sin a person commits is outside the body, but sexual immoral person sins against his own body. Like, it's not that big of a deal. We're just messing around. We're just having some fun. And that's how we get to where we're at in our society today. It's just, it's just we're just having fun, man. No, not that big of a deal. So many destroyed families because we're just having some fun. 1 Thessalonians 4, 3, for this is the will of God, your sanctification, that you abstain from sexual immorality, that each one of you know how to control his own body in holiness and honor, not in the passion of lust, like the Gentiles who do not know God, or the people of the world who do not know God. We are a different people. If God says no, trust me, he's just trying to bless you, not trying to hurt you ever. He made all this stuff. He knows how it works, and he knows the best way. Verse nine, we must not put Christ to the test as some of them did and were destroyed by serpents. Number three, sin, they were putting Jesus to the test. This is referring to Numbers chapter 21. And uh, basically they said have you, you know, to Moses, have you brought us out here into Egypt to die in the wilderness? No food, no water. We've, we loathe this worthless food. They called God's manna worthless food. Are you guys nuts? Do you know that he can just shut it off anytime he wants to? You know what the Lord did? They questioned his goodness, his grace, and his plan. They didn't believe him at his word. And God sent serpents to come and bite them. Can you imagine? Snakes by the thousands, like chasing down the people, biting them. Why would God do that? Talk about scary, attack of the snakes. I wonder if it had any connection with the Garden of Eden. You don't trust me at my word. You don't listen to me like your father Adam. The snake will come to bite you. You know what they did? Well, they fell down and they were crying out and they cried out to God and said, please, Lord, have mercy on us. Forgive us, help. We've sinned against you. You know what he did? He told Moses, okay, take a bronze serpent, wrap it around a pole, lift it up in the sky, and anybody, anyone who looks upon that pole will be healed. God even shows them grace again. Jesus referenced that moment in John three fourteen. As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. God was calling them back to himself. He says, believe on me. Believe me at my word again. Believe that if you look upon the serpent, you will be healed. Believe me at my word. Trust me. Be obedient to me. Walk with me. That's what he was calling them to do. Jesus calls us to believe on him. He is the one lifted up crucified for the sins of the world, and if we believe on him, we will have life. I want to ask you again today, do you trust God at his word? Do you believe that solely in Christ lies eternal life, life in that abundantly here on earth? You say, yes, I do. Then you don't need that sexual temptation. You don't need that substance. You don't need that raise. You don't need that material stuff. You don't need that hatred in your heart. You don't need that stuff to find fulfillment. You need Christ. Verse 10 says, nor grumble as some of them did and were destroyed by the destroyer. Yep, another one. They were grumbling and complaining, sin number four. And uh, this is Numbers chapter 16, if you want to write it down. Numbers 16, what happens is a group of people come up and rise up against Moses We don't like what you're doing. We don't think you're representing the Lord. Moses, a group of them. You're not not really a follower of God. You know, you're doing this wrong. You know what Moses does in front of them? The text says that he falls down on his face and bows down and starts praying to God in front of them. He prays this, Lord, if you are with them, then show up with them tomorrow. If you are with me, then show up with me tomorrow. And tomorrow we will see who God is with. You know what happens the next day? Moses shows up, he gives a little speech, 
And it says there in the text that the ground opens up and swallows these grumbling people. All of their possessions, all of their stuff, their little tent encampment, the whole thing just earthquake. The whole thing just caves in. And they all die. Grumbling, complaining against God that he is not going to sustain and help. Another sin, one that we wouldn't think is sinful. But Philippians 2.14, Paul affirms this. He says, do all things without grumbling or questioning that you may be blameless and innocent, children of God, without blemish, in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation, among whom you shine as lights in the world, holding fast to the word of life, so that in the day of Christ I may be proud that I did not run in vain or labor in vain. He says, do stuff without grumbling or without question. Be a light to those who are around you. They're watching you. The greatest example of not grumbling is Jesus, our King. For the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross, despising the shame. He went like a lamb led to the slaughter. He did not open his mouth. He did it without grumbling. He worshiped God in the midst of the darkest moment of all of history. Amazing. Look at verse 11. Now, these things happened to them as an example, but they were written down for our instruction on whom the end of the ages has come. The end of the ages has come. Do you think we're in the end of the age? talking to a pastor about this a couple days ago. He's saying, you know, I mean, is this crazy or what? The the state of the world and where we're at, who knows? Only God knows, but man, it is a weird time. And we need more than ever to shine brightly to bring Christ to our family and friends and neighbors and people in this city more than ever. It's an example for us. They were written down for our instruction, it says, Look at verse 12 and 13. Oh man, this is so good. Gosh, we gotta get this, come on. Therefore, let anyone who thinks that he stands take heed lest he fall. No temptation has overtaken you that is not common to man. God is faithful and he will not let you be tempted beyond your ability. But with the temptation, he will also provide the way of escape that you may be able to endure it. Are you ready? It's a well-known passage. But he says, if you're standing tall, be careful. Take heed lest you fall. Pride comes before the fall. We should never be saying, I thank God that I'm not like them. That sinner over there. So happy I'm, you know, a couple rows away from them right now. You know, it's just like, they just, I would never want to sit next to that sinner. Um, we should never say I'm better or more spiritual than they because you have just placed yourself less spiritually than them. The person dependent upon God is far more spiritual than the person who says, I'm more righteous than them and I don't need Jesus as much as they do. You just lost the race. You just placed last. That's called self-righteousness. You fall right in to being taught a lesson. Pride comes before the fall. You will eat crow. You will pay the piper. You'll be taught the lesson. Look at verse 13, gives us a lot of insight. Let's break it down. Let no temptation, I'm sorry, no temptation has overtaken you that is not common to man. Are you ready? There's no temptation in the world, no sin, no struggle, no or issue that may be overtaking you today that is not common to man or the word man there, humans. This means that everyone struggles with sin the same. We all have the same temptations, sure. The issue, the timing, or the sin or season may be different for everyone, but the temptations we face all carry the same weight over all. Watch this. We are never in a position to say, why do I have to carry heavier burdens in life than that person? Yours is not heavier, it's just different. People may not understand your burden or your temptation, but what you need to understand is the whole earth is being tempted and struggling as well. You are not facing anything that is not common to man, common to humans. Think about it. Death, sickness, disease, sinful temptations. We are all facing things, and you may be already... uh, you You maybe have already faced your biggest challenge in life. Maybe not. But you need to know that you're not alone in this. Others in the universe are struggling. We all go through different seasons and different times of struggles. 
but we are all struggling, no doubt. And yes, you may look at that person's situation and say, man, that thing is definitely not as difficult as mine, but don't worry, yours may be coming. We will all struggle through things in life in different seasons, in different ways. We will all carry a weight. But watch this. No temptation has overtaken you that's not common to man. God is faithful, and he will not let you be tempted beyond your ability. But with the temptation, he will also provide the way of escape that you may be able to endure it. Watch this insight. It's so good. Number one, God is faithful in the midst of your struggle. He's faithful. And he will not let you be tempted beyond your ability. You see that? Focused upon you, the reader. He won't allow it. Sometimes it feels like it's beyond your ability, but it's not. He won't let you be tempted beyond your ability. The word ability implies not being able. Most of you here are probably not able to uh, squat 2,000 pounds, unless we have hidden in the crowd world's strongest man that I don't know about. Um, but think about this. If you're not able to lift 2,000 pounds, then that is not the weight which God will allow to be put on you. You will not be tempted or tested beyond your ability upon what you are able to lift. He knows your strength. He knows your frailties. He knows what you were able to carry and be tested in this. And this means that you are able to carry this. You say, no, I'm not. I say, yes, you are. Christ in you is how you are able to lift that part of your life. But with the temptation, he will also provide the way of escape that you may be able to endure it. God will provide a way of escape. Did you hear that? God will provide he will provide. Well, where is it? I don't see it. He will provide. He says it in his text. It's one that you can't see. It's an escape. It's one that you can't feel. He will make a way. It is one you will be able to endure, and you don't know how. And so many times, just even in the last couple of years, you know, where you wonder whether or not you're even going to make it, whether or not it's going to work out, whether or not that's going to pull through and you're burdened by it and it stresses you out and overwhelms you and it crushes you. And then you see God pull through and you're like, how in the world did I get through that? So if you have a temptation in front of you right now, a struggle, a test, a hardship, a desert, a wilderness of 40 years, he will not tempt you beyond what you are able and he will provide a way, a way of escape from the danger, and you will endure it. I don't know what it is in your life, but know this. God is faithful. He is able. He keeps his promises. And the context of this has to do with sin. Right? We just looked at those four sins, and he says, you'll be a way to escape that. The sin is too much. No, it's not. He's going to carry you through it. But he is the one who will carry us through. Throw away the idols, remove them from your life, get them away from you. The final verses, I'm not gonna be able to uh, dig completely into, but I'll just tell you what it's saying. It's verses 15 to 22. What Paul does is he takes two picture illustrations. He takes the sacrifices of the Old Testament, sacrificing for sins, and he takes the communion of the believer, and he says this. How can we come as a church together and partake communion and celebrate the Lord Jesus? Watch this. Then walk out of here and take communion with the demons in the city and say, hey, let's worship together. Cheers, mate. We take communion in the church and we worship our Savior, his death and resurrection, forgiveness of sins. Now, let's go take communion with the demons. Let's go take communion with the world. Paul says this is not even possible. This must be removed from us. We are a people who worship the Almighty, we worship the Lord Jesus, and we knock down the communion table of the demons. There's no way I will sit at this table. I have nothing to do with it. Paul is trying to get them to stop living the double life. And we need this word. Because church, I believe that as we turn to the Lord Jesus with all of our hearts and get away from sin, get away from Egypt, get away from those things which entangle us, walk in obedience. You can overcome the temptation. Christ has provided a way. You're able. 
We'll get through. Amen?